The foaming icy waters around the two largest islands of the continent have been in turmoil for years. The islands belong to two ancient warrior nations, one a kingdom, the other a republic, who waged bitter naval warfare over the kingdom's right to send her men of war through enemy waterways and the republic's exclusive right to extract the white gold, a precious resource upon which all its wealth depended. No. This is not a storyline from Game of Thrones, it's the Cod Wars, and remarkably, they occurred between two NATO allies, the United Kingdom and Iceland. Although few shots were fired in anger, superpowers could have easily have become involved, which might have resulted in an armed conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union between NATO and the Warsaw Pact, culminating in a nuclear exchange in World War III. Well, that last bit might have been a bit of an exaggeration, but as history buffs, it's always fun to play around with history. Helv Halvardsen, skipper of the Icelandic gunboat Thor, looks at the flickering radar screen. His junior officer had just called over to him, and he's able to confirm what his officer suspects he has just seen. Trawlers! he exclaims, and several of them in Thai formation! Then, gritting his teeth, he gives the order, Change course! We may be able to get in just in time. Little more than a converted deep-sea fishing vessel with a displacement of only 700 tons, the Thor is one of Iceland's Lilliputian navy, which has for the last several months been patrolling the high seas of the North Atlantic. Except the Thor's 44-year-old captain, whose youthful appearance has earned in the moniker Babyface among the British trawlermen, doesn't see it that way. These are no longer the high seas, for Iceland has just unilaterally declared this part of the Atlantic Ocean its exclusive economic zone, and for Helv Harvardsen, the microfloat of English trawlers are little more than vulgar poachers. He sends the command full speed ahead to the engine room. On the deck, in his trench coat and with his binoculars to his eyes, Harvardson has something of the appearance of Napoleon Bonaparte just before a major battle. Then on the horizon, he spots a ship, and soon he can make out the letters and numbers on its bow. GY527. It's the Ross Resolution, a light trawler from the northern English fishing port of Grimsby. It's already well known to the Icelandic Coast Guard as a habitual poacher. Captain Halvardsen orders the Thor's 57mm cannons to be uncovered. Yet it won't be guns that he will be using against the Ross Resolution. Rather, it will be Iceland's feared new weapon. Specially designed cutters that will shear through the wire cables of the trawler's nets. If the operation succeeds, the high tension of the cables will make them snap like violin strings. Meanwhile, the British trawler's skipper is also looking through his binoculars, having been alerted to the Thor's presence by his own radar screen. He sights a ship heading his way at full steam and recognizes the distinctive profile of the Icelandic gunboat. It's babyface again, he probably mutters to himself. Not wishing to take any risks, for fishermen have already been badly injured from the whiplash of cable cards, he reaches for his radio and calls for help. But the British frigate HMS Andromeda, which has been tracking the Thor for some time with her powerful radar, is already on the case. Although the Andromeda has a top speed of 30 knots, almost twice that of Thor's, she still has some headway to make up. They may make it just in time. You're illegally fishing in Icelandic waters, Havardsen calls to the British trawler with his thick Icelandic accent that I'm not even going to attempt. But suddenly, Rule Britannia fills the airwaves. Instead of replying to the Icelandic captain, the trawlermen have piped from a tape recorder a splurge of British patriotism. You're obstructing international shipping, calls the crisp Oxbridge and Dartmouth Naval College educated voice of the frigate's commander as she pulls up behind the Icelandic gunboat. Having seen the Thor's uncovered gun, he orders his two 114mm cannons be uncovered. This is bloody daft. If you fire... I'll sink you. A Leander-class frigate with the displacement of 3,200 tons, the slender Andromeda is over four times heavier than the Thor, but what she can make up for with speed, she loses in maneuverability. Helv, babyface Halvardsen, can easily duck his gunboat behind the warship and make a run for the nets. The game of cat and mouse is on. Over the next hour, the Thor's passage is repeatedly blocked by the Andromeda's expensive flank as she pulls in from her port side. Meanwhile, the two ships give repeated bursts of five deafening blasts from their sirens. This usually means, according to international maritime law, they're not taking the necessary measures to avoid a collision. 
As Captain Halvarsson would later complain to an embedded ITN reporter, the frigate's strategy of coming in from a port side is designed to make it look as if the Icelanders are at fault in the event of the collision, and they've refused to give way. But of course, this is completely false. Overtaking frigates must always give way, as any sea captain worth his salt will tell you. Indeed, before long, the inevitable happens. The Andromeda cuts up the Thor with a horrendous grinding of metal. The daughter of Cassiopeia meets the Norse god of thunder in a scraping, ear-wrenching clash of the titans. It's all over. The bow of the Thor is badly buckled, and her heating system is partially knocked out. She must now limp back to port for repairs. But so too must a more lightly built HMS Andromeda, which has now a four-meter gash in her side. She arrives in the Devonport dockyards a few days later. This mildly fictionalized account of a real-world event took place on the 7th of January 1976, towards the end of the Third Cod War, and it illustrates the kind of encounter that had been taking place between the determined Icelanders who were defending their livelihoods and the British who were, when it boils down to it, bloody-mindedly defending a principle, the right to navigation in international waters, and especially the international nature of these waters and the resources therein, which Her Majesty's government obstinately contended was common property. But to be fair, the British government had been under immense pressure from Grimsby and Hull fishermen, as well as a trawling industry that was highly dependent on the fantastically fertile cod fishing grounds around Iceland. Over 90% of Iceland's foreign earnings came from the oceans, whereas fishing represented barely 1% of the UK's economy. Motives were obviously completely skewed from the very beginning, and this colored the decision-making in both Reykjavik and London throughout the three conflicts. And colorful that decision-making would certainly prove to be. How did they do it? Not just once, but three times, a plucky, demographically challenged microstate, Iceland managed to win international disputes over fishing rights, not just with the United Kingdom, but also with West Germany, Holland, and Denmark, to name just a few. If you're thinking this harks back to the 2016 European Football Championships, then you ain't seen nothing yet. In the three Cod Wars that took place between 1958 and 1976, Iceland really kicked some ass not only on the choppy seas, but also on the world diplomatic stage. Yet the dispute over fish stocks around Iceland, depleted by overfishing, was not by any means new. It was as old as the hills. Or should that be as old as the seas. By as early as the 14th century, fishing boats from the east coast of England were plying the fertile grounds off Iceland, and even then it had begun rankling with the local fishermen, who only saw their catches diminish as a consequence. Inevitably, the Icelanders petitioned the Danish king, Eric III, the then ruler of Iceland, who in turn moaned to Henry V of England about the situation. When the English parliament passed a number of laws to restrict fishing, no one was fooled, especially not the English fishermen, who took the measures for what they were worth a symbolic acquiescence to Danish pressure. And then they simply continued fishing as per usual. Naturally, tensions quickly mounted, and this early fishing dispute may have become a contributing factor during the build-up of the Anglo-Hanseatic War, which lasted from 1469 to 1474. The matter was ostensibly settled at the signing of the Treaty of Utrecht at the war's end, with the British agreeing to the issuance of seven-year fishing licenses. But the real trouble started in the 19th century, when when steam power allowed sea fishing to take on industrial proportions. Hordes of steam trawlers would sweep up tons and tons of fish, clearing huge swaths of the sea floor of a precious natural resource. Even back then, they were already driving some species, such as cod, to near extinction. Then, in 1893, the Danes, giving support to their Icelandic and Faroese fishermen, said enough was enough, and declared a 50 nautical mile fishing limit around their shores. Worried about the precedent that this would set and the implications for international shipping, the British simply replied, essentially, well, get lost, and the fishing continued. When a few years later, the Danes meekly inquired, well, how about 13 miles, the British replied by sending in warships. Things were heating up. At one point, a British skipper was captured, lashed the mast of a Danish gunboat, and jailed for illegal fishing. 
Yet gunboat diplomacy would soon prevail. The 1901 Anglo-Danish Territorial Waters Agreement set a limit of only three nautical miles for all Danish territorial waters. This was naturally massively advantageous to the British, and the three-mile limit would rapidly become the de facto international standard. Great Britain, still at the height of her imperial power, was then able to impose these kinds of constraints on the rest of the world. But this was not to last. By the 1930s, the Norwegians and Russians were grumbling persistently about foreign fishing boats close to their shores, and particularly about the three-mile limit. While the Norwegians mainly wanted to close off fjords with so-called baselines, the Russians wanted to protect the rich stocks of the Barents Sea. Both tried to reach an agreement with Great Britain, and both failed to come away with anything satisfactory. The dusty negotiating tactic of 19th century British Prime Minister Lord Palmerston held sway. Gunboat diplomacy still worked, but only just. But the tide turns after the Second World War, and with a strengthened Soviet Union, an enfeebled Great Britain found herself increasingly impotent when faced with Soviet insistence. Without explicitly renouncing the prior agreement of three miles, Stalin made it very clear that he no longer wanted foreign trawlers within 12. He accused them of spying and sent in the Russian Navy to kick them out. At first, the British government tried to hold out, fearful for her prestige and power, while obsessing about the principle and precedent that this would set for the increasingly Bolshevik. Norwegians. But by 1949, and following a number of confrontations off the Kola Peninsula, Great Britain was forced to concede to Stalin's new limits. Britain's power was waning, and the remaining P words she was so concerned about prestige, principle, and precedence were all looking rather ropey indeed. As an English newspaper of the time lamented, gone were the days when trawlers could happily fish close to the Russian shoreline while a British gunboat cruised idly around like an old hen guarding her chicks. It turns out, however, that the paranoid Soviet dictator may not have been quite so paranoid after all. Some of the trawlers had indeed been equipped with powerful radio receivers for listening into Russian communications. Although Britain never officially conceded defeat to the Russians, the rest of the world didn't quite see it that way, especially the Norwegians. When toward the end of 1948 talks failed in London between the two countries, an exasperated Britain, convinced of her righteousness, took the case to the International Court of Justice in The Hague. But in 1951, and to the complete surprise of only the British, The Hague ruled in Norway's favour. Now desperate to keep Norway on board with the old war allies' new alliance against Russia, the newly birthed NATO, Britain rolled on her back and graciously conceded defeat. The British were good losers, as one Norwegian diplomat put it. But would they really turn out? to be such good losers. Iceland, newly independent from Denmark and emboldened by Norway's victory at The Hague, now wanted to show the rest of the world what she was made of. And Iceland, like Norway, was a key strategic interest for NATO, except even more so for Iceland is the I am what NATO tacticians call the GI-UK gap, two narrow strips of ocean between Greenland and Iceland and Iceland and the UK. In the event of war, these strips would become critical choke points for Soviet submarines stationed in the Baltic and Barents Sea, since they must pass through one of these passages to reach the wider Atlantic. The NATO powers, in particular the US, were concerned that Iceland should not fall into the Soviet sphere. If they did, it could give the Soviets control over the gap and spell disaster for American strategists. And the Icelanders knew this perfectly well. The Cold War card would give them immense leverage during the Cod Wars to come, especially if they threatened to leave the NATO alliance and eject the newly built NATO Air Force base at their western port of Keflavik. This left the British in an almost impossible position, torn between their vociferous, virulent, and frequently violent, but economically insignificant fishing industry, and geopolitical strategic alliances. When in early 1952 an Icelandic delegation was snubbed during a diplomatic visit to London, and their proud and nationalistic leader, Eyrfur Thors, was fobbed off with meetings with low-level functionaries rather than with the Prime Minister Winston Churchill as he might have expected, the slight would turn out to be a diplomatic blunder of epic proportions. Thors had come to see the big fish, not the minnows, and the delegation quickly left the country in a huff. Soon afterwards, the furious and now intransigent Icelanders declared a four nautical mile exclusion zone for fishing along with baselines out of Norway to cut off bays, even using isolated rocky islets as reference points which their own legal advisers suggested might be daring. Of course, in legal speak, daring usually means just completely bonkers. And no amount of protest from France, Belgium, West Germany, the Netherlands, and especially the UK would make them budge. Their decision was final, and they were no longer answering foreign petitions, not even the telephone. Instead, they responded by arresting foreign trawlers. What the Icelanders, and the rest of the world for that matter, did not quite anticipate 
however, is the domino effect that their decision would soon have. While Iceland relied on fish for most of its foreign earnings, it also relied on the UK as a primary export market, and when the trawler owners of Grimsby and Hull put pressure on the harbour authorities and declared a landing ban for all Icelandic produce, the Soviet Union stepped in and offered to barter Icelandic fish for oil. Naturally, this not only alarmed the British government, but also the Americans, who by then were already in a paroxysmal state of paranoia with respect to Soviet intentions. Since independence in 1946, Iceland had been vacillating between East and West, and the foaming waters of socialist fervor could easily have boiled over at any time. The fierce Icelanders were not natural capitalists, and as the current Icelandic president once grimly remarked, if communism had not existed, the Icelanders would have invented it. The West knew this all too well, and to save the day, President Eisenhower went so far as to suggest that the United States could buy up the entire export of Icelandic fish and give it to some needy country. America instead of Russia would become Iceland's fishmonger. Meanwhile, the UK remonstrated with the stroppy Grimsby and Hull trawler owners and fishermen, pointing out that their landing ban risked a strategic disaster for NATO, but an entrenched fishing industry was having none of it. Even the Alan Sugar of his day, the colorful Cockney businessman George Dawson, became involved and tried to circumvent the ban by setting up his own distribution network. But this venture failed, and the government had become well and truly a hostage of its own powerful fishing lobby. With continued arrests of British trawlers off Iceland, the stroppy owners and fishermen became stroppier still, and things reached ahead in 1955, when the government was forced to conclude in a cabinet paper that warships would have to be sent to take all necessary steps to prevent arrest and to rescue any arrested vessels. Meanwhile, the Americans blamed the British for pushing the plucky and ferociously independent Icelanders into the Soviet sphere of influence. The Cod War and the Cold War were both heating up, and the Soviet invasion of Hungary in October of the following year did nothing to calm down the situation. It was with this as a backdrop that the first United Nations Law of the Sea Conference began in Geneva on the 2nd of February 1958, with the hope of settling fishing rights and the wider issue of territorial waters once and for all. In many ways, the Geneva Conference was doomed from the very beginning, while moderate countries such as Canada discussed various options such as a six nautical mile limit for territorial waters plus an extra six miles for fishing. A whole block of Latin American countries were pushing for a whopping 200 mile maritime border. Meanwhile, the British delegation, edged on by American neutrality, stuck to their guns and lent their ears to no one except those who supported what they still considered to be the status quo of three miserly nautical miles. For them, it was a matter of principle, not to mention prestige, power, and precedence. Britannia still ruled the waves. Yet the Icelanders' position remained surprisingly moderate and lay somewhere in between the two extremes. At that time, they made the modest request of 12 miles of territorial waters with exclusive fishing rights. While post-colonial strife among Asian and African nations may have been a factor, that mixed up with Cod and Cold War antagonisms meant that the conference ended with everyone agreeing to disagree, to put it very politely. But if the conference did have a takeaway, it was this. Britannia's stubbornness had cost her dearly, and the three-mile rule was clearly a dead duck. A frustrated Iceland now felt entirely free to say screw this and went on to declare unilaterally a 12 nautical mile exclusion zone around its shores. The Cod Wars had begun. The first British warships arrived in August 1958, which saw Iceland's diminutive fleet of six gunboats and antique Second World War Catalina flying boats pitted against a flotilla of state-of-the-art frigates and destroyers more wired up for electronic Cold War warfare. Tankers and other support vessels gave back up. When on the 2nd of September, a party from the Icelandic flagship Thor boarded the Grimsby trawler Northern Foam, which had been caught fishing in grounds codenamed Spearmint, the Royal Navy's frigate HMS Eastbourne came to the rescue. But when the frigate's the captain also boarded the trawler, and the three captains exchanged expletives on the bridge. The crew left back on the Thor, took decisive action, and sped away, forcing the Eastbourne to take the Icelanders on board as guests. Back on land, the Icelandic population did not see it at all that way. The Thor's boarding party were declared prisoners. Another incident nearby, which saw trawlermen attacking Icelandic borders with boat hooks and an axe, proved to be more than public opinion could take. That evening, as the British ambassador Andrew Gilchrist was giving a dinner, an angry mob gathered outside. Thinking they were not quite angry enough, and in approved Pukka Sahib tradition, as Time magazine would later put it, a maverick Gilchrist decided to provoke the Icelanders with the hope of showing them in the worst 
possible light. He played military marches on his gramophone, and when some bagpipes could be heard, he even danced a Scottish jig, allegedly. The Icelanders rose to the bait and threw rocks and flares. Soon the cool Icelandic air coming in through the shattered panes put a stop to the polite conversation at the ambassador's residence, and the guests, mostly foreign reporters, left and wrote up their stories. The unruly and uncouth Icelanders were now rioting. Ambassador Andrew Gilchrist had scored the propaganda coup that he wanted. Tensions were rising, and with the two superpowers keen to defend their strategic interests, especially with a highly significant NATO military base at stake, the whole thing could blow up to the Iceland's own Cuban Missile Crisis. Soon the Danes started grumbling about a 12-mile limit around their Faroe Islands, and pressure mounted further still. Back in the UK, there was even talk about sending British naval protection there as well. While gunboats, trawlers, and frigates battled it out on the high seas, everyone could see that something had to be done to break out of this impasse. A diplomatic solution was needed. Following further gridlock, at the Second Law of the Sea conference held in Geneva over the winter of 1960 and 1961, where a decent workable compromise had a near miss due to a restrictive two-thirds majority voting rule, Norway came to Iceland's rescue by acting unilaterally and making official the Hague's ruling of 1951. Enforcement would hereafter be strict. The tide had clearly turned, and now under immense pressure, the British finally bowed to the inevitable and conceded the 12 nautical mile limits. In exchange for withdrawing British warships, Iceland would forgive unpaid fines handed out to skippers for illegal fishing. After a lot of splashing, the First Cod War was finally over. Although the settlement of the Second Geneva Conference entailed that future disputes would be referred to The Hague, international law and diplomacy were to fail yet again. The Icelandic COD continued their industrial action and refused to increase their numbers, and by September 1972, the Icelanders were as much concerned about conservation as their own catches. Yet even the plucky microstate did not quite dare use the nuclear option and go full Latin America style with a 200-mile exclusion zone. They settled instead for 50. The furor that followed with almost universal condemnation from not only the rest of Western Europe but also the Warsaw Pact, did nothing to change the Icelanders' resolve. The fish were theirs, and this time their gunships were armed with a new weapon borrowed from naval mine clearance operations, the dreaded wire cutters. The British, however, were reluctant to send warships in this time, worried as they were about Iceland's increasingly vocal threats to leave NATO. To the derision of the fishermen, they sent instead the ocean-going tug Lloydsman. Although the Lloydsman would prove to be a tough cookie, and she more than admirably held her ground, the fishermen were mainly left to their own devices to battle it out with the Icelandic gunboats. While in the First Cod War the threat of full naval warfare was omnipresent, the Second Cod War denigrated into dodgem cars on the high seas, as one commentator colorfully put it, with tugs and trawlers dodging and ramming gunboats in an effort to avoid the metallic jaws of Iceland's new fearsome weapon. Bowing to NATO pressure, Britain again conceded defeat in 1973, but when an embargo Boldened Iceland finally went nuclear and declared a 200 nautical mile limit in 1975, the British warships were soon to return. The Third Cod War turned out to be one of the most fierce military encounters that has ever taken place between so-called allies, reaching an all-time low when, at one point, Iceland threatened to cut off diplomatic relations. It also claimed the Cod War's only casualty, an Icelandic electrician electrocuted and killed during repairs to the gunboat Agia. Yet, in the meantime, something else had changed, and that thing was the North Sea oil. The British, along with several other countries, had been eyeing up the huge economic advantage a 200-mile limit would bring, as it would also give them exclusive access to the newly discovered rich North Sea reserves. The British fishing industry, with its feeble 1% contribution to national wealth, would then pale into insignificance. The new black gold oil was going to take precedence over the ancient white gold of cod. Up to then, the British government had felt a moral obligation to support their trawlermen, who had heroically contributed to the war effort, but by 1976, the Second World War was becoming little more than a distant memory. With the diplomatic, strategic, and now economic mess they were increasingly finding themselves drawn into, the British finally took the decision to throw their fishermen under the bus and concede defeat. The negotiated settlement between Britain and Iceland stipulated that from June 1976, only a few trawlers would be allowed within the 200-mile zone, and for a very limited time period, 
period of six months. The British fishing industry would be decimated, devastating the ports of Grimsby and Hull. Yet to the great satisfaction of countries with offshore oil reserves such as Mexico, Nigeria, the United Kingdom, and especially Norway, the 200 nautical mile limit would soon become the de facto international standard. The wild diplomatic back and forths, along with the successes and failures of the various bargaining positions of all sides during the Cod Wars, have become the subject of academic research and are now considered a case in point in the field of international relations. As one 2016 article published in the journal European Security put it, to explain the Cod Wars, one has to take account of the impact of one public pressure on elites, two elites steering public opinion, three Iceland's political culture, four organized interest groups, five alliance politics, six miscalculation, and seven competition and unilateral behavior by diplomats. And while it might be possible to think of upteen other factors which may have contributed to the final outcome of the Cod Wars, one cannot help but wonder whether, in the end, it all simply boiled down to the arrogance, grim determination, and sheer bloody-mindedness of both the plucky Icelanders and the stuffy British hankering after the past glories of empire. When, during the 2008 financial crisis, the Icelandic bank Landsbanki went bust and was placed into receivership, the then British Chancellor of the Exchequer, Alistair Darling, used a provision in the anti-terror legislation to freeze the assets of its IceSave subsidiary in London. The outcry in Iceland was deafening, and one Icelandic teenager even went so far as to sarcastically photograph himself dressed as a jihadist, complete with a black balaclava and faux Kalashnikov. The spectre of the Cod Wars had never left Iceland's frozen shorelines.